Traffic there. Lather, just take it up to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following a Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Stop Charlie Sierra. Two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north. And we're going to just make you, uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final. Runway nine are clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's, 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 listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's cleared to land runway nine if you can make it. If not, just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. What we got? A tricycle. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green. Uh, green dot. Then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine. All the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern. Charlie here. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My okay, here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the flagman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out those, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to resequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once we're out, too. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get uh, try to get you back here. Can our got the uh, jet inside? Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot. I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're going to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight. And you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind the, you out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me. So I should know better than that. After 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers. At the, uh, over the graphs at the numbers. I want you to keep T minus one minute and counting. Hello. One. Hello. 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 Happy 
Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us on this Thursday evening. It's a bit grim, at least in Wiltshire, it's a bit grim and drizzly and everything out there. And if you can't read this, it says, join the Flyer Club, £52 a year or five quid a month. If you haven't done it yet, go do it now. Or nice answers. Not right. <laughs> not right not, yeah, yeah. I've got another message to go on there yet later as well. So, uh, all right. Anyway, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, first things first, though, um, apologies for the first email that went out that had the link to the StreamYard thing, which probably wouldn't have worked for you happily because we'd have had gazillion guests in here, although we do have the ability and the power to boot guests out, so don't try it just for fun. Um, and hopefully you found us now. That's good. So we've got a great show coming up tonight, um, all sorts of stuff. I can see John Zarno is already sitting there in the uh, green room waiting, which is great news, as is Sarah. What? Where? Uh, yeah. Well, basically, I don't own any. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and get mine in a minute. Yeah, and Dave, Dave has more Christmas jumpers than than the team needs, really, in one for one <laughs> individual. So Dave's Dave's doing it for the team. You would have heard. You would have heard that yesterday we had our our kit off challenge. Um, and more on that a little bit later. But basically, my Christmas jumper was worn during that challenge. But at the end of it, ended up with far too much. Um, Glue, glue, basically glue. stuck all over yeah. it, which was a bit unfortunate. So my Christmas jumper is far on its way to being an ex Christmas jumper. Anyway, um, first things first. Thank you very much, Sky Demon, for sponsoring this. You've been a fantastic sponsor during 2022. We hope that continues for a long time into 2023. It's really genuinely appreciated and makes makes this just possible, as it were. So let me just quickly scroll down here and deliver everyone this week's Sky Demon tip. And there's some exciting things coming in 2023 from the Sky Demon tip front. Hi, I'm Tim from Sky Demon. Welcome to today's top tip. When you plan a flight in Sky Demon, you don't have to tell us a takeoff time, but if you do, it can help. Here's a flight I've planned in France. There are quite a few NOTAM for it. And this restricted area here is clearly an obstruction to our flight. But if you go into flight details, you can see that we're currently assuming we're going to be taking off any time today or tomorrow. Let's be a bit more specific with this. And we'll change it so we're going to go flying this Saturday the 5th. Instantly, this restricted area has faded out because it's not active at the weekend. And if you go into the NOTAMs list, you can see the takeoff time here, and there are far fewer bulletins in the list than there were. To reset it, just go to takeoff, and go back to today or tomorrow. For more information on any of our features, go to skydemon.aero and choose help and support. That's pretty useful. Yeah. It's very useful. In fact, it's one of those things I do, maybe one of the only things I do religiously. Otherwise, sometimes you just get all that kind of rubbish and you go, ah, oh. and then it goes. It's great. Brilliant. Good, 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 good. Right. Having thanked Sky Demon, having seen a great tip, it must be time. Oh, Michael Wolf, hello, and welcome to you too. We look forward to it. I hope you've got your antlers on too, is all I can say. Um, actually, look, it's my sporty shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to I bought that with my own money. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. How you doing? Oh, guys. And a quick question from Ald and Andrew Caldcott. Um, if we were to appear in Panto... <laughs> Who would you be, Ian? The fairy godmother or the Grinch? Clearly the Grinch. I think. <laughs> I think I was I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking, you know, 2023, when the flyer team becomes just even more video centric, maybe next year we should put on the flyer team Christmas panto. No, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Ed would then have to buy Ed seeing seeing Ed as the uh uh, dressed up in whatever, you know, that would be too funny. I'm right. Anyway, look, we, need, <laughs> we need to move on. So I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring in. Let's have some weather. Let's oh well, that's not too bad actually. That's that not works. Bad, right? well, before, we, before we do that, we should probably just go. Hello, Simon, how are you? Good evening, all. I can't unsee Ed dressed as the pantomime dame. I'm trying my best. But I just can't understand. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll lend you my mind bleach when I finish with it. I thought they were. I thought they were photos I only shared with you, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you sent the wrong link. It went out to everyone. 
Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, let's see if I can get this. Oh, I can't get that. Oh, oh, no, no, no. oh we got, small, got small. Are we going to oh, get small weather, Big Simon? Or are we going to do? Oh, How are we going to no. go? Oh, there we go. That'll work. How about Excellent. That? Right, you're all on screen, so you've all got to look interested now. Although, I see, Johnny's already left. He knows what's coming. Um, okay. Uh, right. Good evening, everybody. And uh, here we go. The Christmas forecast. Hopefully, you can get some flying in. Uh, over the Christmas period. It's not as straightforward uh, a forecast as we might want to see, but this is how tomorrow looks uh, if you're already broken up from work. Looks like we've got a front coming north tomorrow, bringing some pretty heavy rain, stretching all the way through Ireland, through Wales, through the Midlands, East Anglia and the South East. Basically, it's a pretty crappy sort of day. Uh, low cloud and really no, no flying, no VFR flying really to be found. Even in the southwest, when it does dry up a little bit later on, the cloud's still going to be low. We're still looking at sort of 1,500 foot cloud bases. So that's going to be covering high ground across the southwest. A little bit better for northern Scotland in the colder air there. Base is about three to 4,000 feet, lighter winds, better visibility. But southern Scotland probably going to be seeing the remnants of a front there. And the base is, uh, as you can see here on the cloud ceiling chart, that yellow colour telling us 1,000 to 2,000 foot bases and outbreaks of rain as well. So Friday, not exactly the best of days. So Christmas Eve, this is how things shape up for Saturday. Actually, it's looking a little bit better across central and eastern areas on Saturday. And they always think there's going to be a fair amount of cloud around, but with a breeze there, it should lift the bases a bit. So we should be into three, four thousand foot bases tops at around about eight to ten thousand feet for much of central and eastern England. I do think southern coast of England may just get a little bit of rain or perhaps even some drizzle at times. Bases slipping below two thousand foot there at times and across these western coasts as well one or two showers coming in but not too bad we're looking at bases two to three thousand feet as well so uh actually it's not too bad a day for christmas eve for most of us christmas day looks like this low pressure is in control a little area of low pressure zips across southern parts of england and kind of moves through east anglia in the southeast so looks like it is going to be some uh, fairly heavy rain around there during the course of christmas day and then we get a front coming into western parts of the uk bringing some showers across western scotland western wales as well as western parts of england but eastern scotland northern and eastern parts of england should actually fare a little bit better so if you're feeling brave and you want to spend a few brownie points uh, and I mean brave as in terms of not brave because you're flying, but brave because you're going to leave the family to it. Uh, actually, eastern Scotland and eastern parts of England on Christmas Day look to be about the best. Boxing Day at the moment, not looking too bad. Looks a little bit showery, but I think more flyable. But I have to say, I'm not brave enough to show you that chart yet because the confidence in that is so low. But it does look as if at some point through the course of next week, there are going to be one or two flying days to be found. Now, throughout the Christmas period, I'm going to be doing uh, my special 12 days of Metmus. And uh, this is going to be a hint or a tip about the weather every single day through Christmas from the 25th of December. And I'm even going to throw in a few giveaways in there as well. So if you want to get involved, follow me on the Instagram channel at Weather School UK or do a search on uh, Facebook for Weather School. And we'll have a bit of fun just to brighten up those dull days after Christmas and follow the hashtag there, Metmus. So all remains for me, folks, is to say have a fantastic Christmas. I'll be back with your New Year forecast next year. But in the meantime, have a brilliant Christmas. And I hope that Santa brings you everything that you hope for. Bye for now. Don't, don't go just yet. I've got a quick question for you. Those charts, that, the charts that you show, and, yeah. and the one for tomorrow, which looked a bit grim, to be honest, when I was kind of hoping it, I was going to bunk off and go flying, yeah. um, but maybe not. Um, are they are they midday charts? Yeah, so that's mid that's midday. But to be honest, in tomorrow doesn't really make much difference because this front is so slow moving anyway. It's only going to creep okay. very very slowly northwards, and I think that's going to be the position for for most of the day. That thing just not going anywhere particularly very quickly. Thank you, Dex. Well, I Sorry. guess in that case, I might go to work or something then. Well, thank you very much, Simon. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Goodness me. <laughs> I might just go to the pub instead. Then. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's better. Steady on. Have a have a have a great Christmas. Let's see if I can uh, let's see if I can run this and sort out the world in the meantime. Okay. Merry Christmas. Not almost, almost, but not quite. So if I mean, do, 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 do. Oh, oh, how did that? Still got a well, still... window up. Hang on, let me get rid of that. There you go. That's better. 
That wasn't there earlier. Hello, yeah. Sarah. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good, thank you. I've got a confession. I don't own one Christmas jumper, <laughs> and I feel like a real Scrooge. But I'm glad no, I'm not the only. <laughs> you have got some antlers at least somewhere, have you? No, I literally have nothing. I must look like the Grinch. I've got nothing in this house. I was going to say, I, I think you are going to be the Grinch, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I honestly, I've threatened to cancel Christmas to my children many times this week, <laughs> but it's really been deserved. So. <laughs> but it's but good anyway, to see that you. Good to see you've put some Christmas stuff in your office. Well done. Um, yeah, so, what have you got to say about the club then? Um, I've got lots to say about the club. Become a member in December. Just do it. Just get it done. Treat yourself to a Christmas present and um, just join the Flyer Club. I've actually I spent a bit of time because I was curious. I was counting up how many airfields we had take part in our um, scheme for free landing vouchers. So we had 38 airfields this year. And I spent a lot of time tallying it all up. And that's actually a saving of £339, um, which is absolutely incredible. And you think about it, and the membership is £52 a year, or you can pay £5 a month, and you can have access to all of that savings, basically. So now's the best time to join. We've got January starting. We've got loads of new airfields in January already lined up. Um, so it's just the best time to join, really. So as well as exclusive content and webinars, um, you get a discount code you can use online at Paulie's Flight Equipment. And um, I mentioned it last week, but I'll say it again to give you an idea of what you could use that um, voucher on. You could get, if you're in the market for a Sky Echo, you could get the cheapest Sky Echo on the market. And um, you could get the cheapest Aeroshell W100 oil. So it really, really is a no-brainer. Just become a member in December and uh, join what we believe is the best Britain's best flying club. So if, just if do it. If, if loads of people join, will you buy a Christmas jumper in the January sales and wear it on? Absolutely. I'll wear it in oh, January. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Let's nice all, let's all see Sarah with a Christmas jumper in January. <laughs> and uh, go from there. Right. Let's have a little. It must be time for some news. We're going to rattle through news because we've got a great guest, John Zarnay, for us there. So let's move swiftly over to Dave. Uh, Dave, take us away with some news. Well, the first item is just simply to remind people that we have the PDF compilation of uh, the magazine uh, available to download <coughs> on the website. You simply go along to the, the, the tab called Magazine, click there, and if you're a member of the Flyer Club or a reader member, you can download uh, the PDF, which you can read offline anywhere. Um, that's it, really. Excellent. Great. Well, in that case, I'll just put myself up here so you can all read this. Uh, quick news story for me. This is the news of the uh, Bristow's airspace change proposal, uh, which they're doing on behalf of the Maritime Agency, and they've moved that forward to the next stage. They've got approval to pass from stage one to stage two. They've basically proposed a couple of uh, outcomes to replace the temporary danger areas in the channel. Uh, option number one uh, is is basically to turn it into a permanent um, danger area with a danger area information service so you can get information from london information you could obviously fly over the top of it but if you need to fly underneath it it needs to it would only be activated apparently um when they need it and not all the time but uh, who knows and option number two is kind of exactly the same space but they've created they're suggesting the creation of two corridors i don't know if they're one-way corridors looking at that um, yeah one way you know, if they're one-way corridors, that's a problem. Uh, I'm going to suggest that that's a bit of a non-starter as a one-way corridor, personally. Uh, I know a lot of people go from Cat Green A to, to Dover, um, which is obviously the shortest crossing. But anyway, um, that would those one-way corridors would be Class G. It wouldn't require anything to go through them, but they are only surfaced 1,500 feet, which is pretty low for crossing the channel, unless the weather's pants, in which case it's... It's, it's kind of what you want, at least if you are VFR. But they're also proposing that would come with a danger area uh, crossing service and danger area uh, information service as well. So, yeah, um, who knows? I have actually, I tried to look through the thing and find out how many days uh, of the year they run those drones on average during daylight hours. And uh, so far, have not found that art, found how. I haven't found that number in any of their documentation. I've sent them an email and asked, but I haven't had a reply yet, but I did only send it today. So there you go. That's that's my... Good point from the Wheelie Plane bloke. Isn't activating the danger over area over the channel just telling the boats when it's safe to cross? Well, yes. I believe you may have, Russ, you may have 
possibly highlighted a flaw in their plan. Well, well I suppose it's one of those what comes first questions, though, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, and you know what? Ed, that, was, that was my news yeah. story. So uh, hopefully you've got an EC news story to deliver because I didn't want to interrupt you because it seemed like you were on a roll. <laughs> oh, man. I need to... <laughs> I was I wondering if, so. if you two had done a swap without telling the rest of us. It's all right. You didn't oh. tell me either. <laughs> did, did, did you, did you um, uh, prepare did you... an EC news story? No. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I'll give you a quick EC story. There was a massively complex and dense document came out saying that there's new, the, there's another work group setting up to create, to look at uh, EC again. Um, but we've got a great feature which Ed Bellum has written that's going to go up on the site soon. And effectively, nothing's going to happen very quickly. It looks very much like they're going to go with international norms, which is effectively ADSB, um, and that it won't be mandatory everywhere. But it probably will be mandatory in an increasing amount of airspace, I would suggest. Um, and it wouldn't, it, I, I wouldn't be entirely shocked if someone said to me at some point in the future, it will be mandatory. So uh, keep a lookout for that uh, feature that's coming up soon. Yeah, and a good, uh, that, good reminder that, that, too that you can still buy EC kit with uh, up to two hundred and fifty pounds off from um, from the CAA until end of March next mm. year. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Well, they've still got money, um, right? Anyone else's story I can steal while we just <laughs> rattle through these? <laughs> Sorry about that, Johnny. It must be you next. Yeah. Uh, so, a couple from uh, Newquay, and I've put the Chris Christmas jumper on now. There we go. Oh, very good. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah, so two from the UK, Virgin Orbit have now got their own license to actually fire the thing. Um, so they'll be launching the rocket south of Ireland in their barbecue sauce bottle shaped danger area, no tamed area from, I think, in January. Um, so it's been a while. They were meant to launch last week, but they didn't get the. Uh, appropriate license from the CAA in time, um, but there is an AIC which you can download. It's 095 slash 2022, which you can read and find out more about what's actually going on. It'd be interesting to see. Um, and it shouldn't, from what we've seen, it shouldn't impact people flying around Cornwall at all because the no tamed area is way 100 miles to the west, about 100 miles south of Ireland. So well out of the way. Um, and the second story from Cornwall is we have the Formal Aviation Heritage Centre on the live stream probably a couple of months ago. Um, they were looking at having to basically shut up shop and the council was going to kick them out. They've now had a bit of a glimmer of hope with a potential new site, which is just outside the airfield. It's a 10 acre site. Um, so they're looking at basically how they can get everything transported over there. In theory, they could do it by moving all the aeroplanes and not having to sort of chop them up and and you know, and all the costs and extra faff that incurs. Um, but they've not really had much support yet. Hmm, sorry, Catkin, I'll turn my mic up. There we go. They've not had much support yet from um, Cornwall Council, so um, you know, it, it would be good for them to offer a bit of financial support for what is one of Cornwall's, but well, certainly Cornwall's best aviation attraction, but also one of Cornwall's best just. General, general museums so it'd be good to see that happening and um yeah get the get the heritage center set up on a new site jolly good um thank you very much before we speed on because we've got a great guest to ed i'm just going to jump in there and say so there's been a couple of comments pointing out that there's a gasco survey on electronic yeah, security I that doesn't take long. long if anyone's got a link to that i've just been trying to find that online i can't see it on their facebook page or their web page if anyone has the link to that survey um send it yeah let us know about it i was going to say you can put it in the comments but you don't have that in the comments. oh you can but yes if you have it you can put it in the comments yeah you can put it in the comments yeah absolutely um your turn ed sorry i haven't stolen this one from you excellent i'm pleased about that <laughs> so some SS ssdr news uh from a company called future vehicles in uh czechia there's a new aeroplane that will fit the SSDR regulations here in the UK. Uh, it's got a brilliant name. It's called the Dingo. It's a single seat open cockpit biplane uh, with a pusher engine and tail wheel undercarriage. Uh, the designer says it's inspired by an American ultralight from uh, the 1970s called the Hovey Wingding. Uh, designed for quick and easy assembly, sheet metal parts are pre-punched and uh, you just rivet them together. 
Max takeoff weight is 220 kilograms. VNE is 54 knots. Cruise 38 knots. Stall 21 knots. Uh, the kit with VAT is about 15k. Just add your choice of engine and prop. Uh, and Dingo can be powered by anything between 25 and 40 horsepower, as long as the engine is under uh, 24 kilograms. Um, so that looks, I, 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 I do quite like SSDRs, and that looks like fun. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I am sat on the front of that aeroplane, but what damage can I do to myself at 38 knots? <laughs> well, I wonder, where, where the hell do you install your glass cockpit? That's true. Um, yes. Um, nowhere. <laughs> okay. I mean, how the hell is it going to fly? Right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for that, uh, Dave. You're back on. Right. Well, this is an interesting little story about Montenegro, a tiny country out in the Balkans. Um, the country Montenegro has launched an international seaplane regatta, and they've bought an Icon A5 amphibious aircraft. And the whole thing, the whole intention, is to promote Montenegro as a seaplane and sport flying base. Um, it's got a great position. It's on the Adriatic coast uh, with two large areas of enclosed water, the Bay of Kotor, I think it is, and Lake Skardar. They sound like things out of Lord of the Rings. But anyway, they're, these are sort of enclosed pieces of water, perfect for seaplane operations. The regatta itself is from the 1st to the 4th of June next year with a packed schedule of activities for anyone participating. We've got a, on the website we, where this story is, we've got a, a couple of nice little videos. Um, one from the guy from Icon who delivered the aircraft to uh, to the people in uh, Montenegro. And we've got another one, which uh, is, is from the organisers of the event, from last year's event. This has only just re resurrected the seaplane regatta, but um, they're, they're really what, going. since last year? Sorry? <laughs> what, resurrected since last year? <laughs> yes. But apparently there's been a seaplane operator. The seaplane operations were originally in the Bay of Qatar, in 1913, it's just since over the communist years, it got, uh, got kind of dropped. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, if they want to promote it, I suggest they uh, they, they should organise, I don't know, a trip, a visit by the flyer team. Maybe that would be tough. We I, could probably manage that. I have dropped them an eye, actually. Important question. Paul Fraser Benison says, will the Count be there? The Count of Monte, Monte, Montenegro. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. <laughs> <laughs> Only if he gets lost. <laughs> right. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Time to move on. Johnny. Yeah. So a real quick one about the flight training industry. Um, FTA Global, who are based at Brighton City, aka Shoreham, are now offering what they call a fair fees policy, which basically means most of the other big schools, if you go and do an integrated course, you'll pay 30 grand up front and then a couple more lots of 30 grand throughout the year or a couple of years. Um, FTA are now doing much smaller but more regular payments. So you'll be sort of paying two, two and a half grand a month for, for the first year. Um, so it basically allows people to spread the cost out and potentially save on interest payments. So it's another, after, after last week's news of TUI offering completely um, no upfront payment cadet schemes, um, it's another, another bit of good news for the industry. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's for sure that the amount of money you have to pay for an integrated scheme is probably the highest in, in, in the biggest one of the biggest barriers. So this mm. this that enables you to almost effectively pay as you go. And we've always been we've always said anyone who ever listened to anyone about flight trainers always say don't don't pay huge amounts up front. Um, so this is a this is a this is a good scheme it seems to me. Yeah. Um, Dave, right, the, another CAA story. The CAA has announced its plan for scalable drone operations. Um, this all goes hand in hand with electronic conspicuity and all that sort of thing. Um, the operations will be by authorised drone operators only. Uh, there are four elements to the plan. Pilot competency, in other words, can you fly a thing properly? Uh, flight worthiness of the drones themselves. They need to do a risk assessment process. Um, how risky is the task? Uh, but the bit we're most interested in is what's going to happen to airspace. Um, short term, they say it's going to be segregated airspace, as it is now, temporary danger areas. Long term, though, they're going to be integrated with detect and avoid technology, which, of course, is where the electronic conspicuity comes in. If you go to the website and read and see the story, there's a video of a chap from the uh, drone operations bit in the CEA talking all about it. 
Is that something specific to beyond vi uh, visual line of sight, Dave? I should have said that. Yes, you're absolutely right, Ed. Yes, this is particularly for opera drone operations, which are beyond visual line of sight. In other words, you, yeah, the, the operator can't see the, the drone at the time. Yeah. Good CRM there, Ed. Good yeah. CRM. <laughs> 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 right, and talking of uh, talking of Ed, here you go. Oh yeah. Time for you to... so, so a quick reminder. Well, not necessarily a reminder because you might not know it's out there. Uh, but we've been flying with the Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset. That's the first of Lightspeed's safety wearable uh, headset range, uh, and this one has the carbon monoxide detector built in. Uh, there's a video. Uh, which is online now. So if you want to find out what we thought about it, um, I'll stick the link in the comments. Uh, you can save it for your Christmas viewing, um, maybe uh, maybe a Christmas Day after you watch The King. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ed. Mm. Um, right, let's see how we can do this. It's time for John. So I'm going to bring John in here. I'm going to just kick off briefly by saying, hello, John. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Good evening. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. In more ways than one. Um, and John, <laughs> John, I'm not sure how long you've been a member of the Flyer Forum, but it's it's for as long as I can remember. It's it's quite a while. You're you're not a newcomer to the Flyer no, Forum. No, 2007 it would be. 2007. Wow. Um, uh, <laughs> well known pilot, well known Cirrus pilot, and um, a little while ago now, I remember like I woke up and like, fired up the Flyer Forum, and there was a post in there. It said. It was something like, I pulled caps today for real. Uh, and I thought, my, my initial thought was, oh, yeah, John's been on a simulator somewhere and, and like, pulled the simulator thing, which is the actual physical handle you can pull in some of the sims. And then I read it, and, and no, you, you actually pulled the, the caps for real. So before we get onto that story, just give us a quick potted history of your flying from kind of, you know, you clearly not a, didn't do your PPO last week, for example. Uh, well, it, it, it's not, uh, I've not got as long a history as some of the people here. Um, I started flying in 2006 because I wanted to use aircraft for, uh, for basically for business travel and also for taking my family away. I learned at Simpson in a, a Robin HR200 and went straight from that after I got my PPL. I, I um, went to America and did an instrument rating straight away and bought a Cirrus. Uh, which was then ferried over here, and I'm uh, until the 16th of November. I've been flying that aircraft, um, I guess, for a total of about what 2,700 odd hours. Wow, and that is I have a picture of that aircraft somewhere that I had put in a special nice order. And that, that that's the aircraft in, in better days, yes, in better days. So let's, let's go back to the day in question, and, and I think I'm just going to leave this to you. So perhaps you can just Talk us through, without skipping too much of the detail, what actually happened. Sure. Um, I was flying back from Mönchengladbach in Germany to Cambridge. I was about 40 miles, I guess, northeast of Ostend, flight level 100 IFR. Um, when I started to get a vibration, uh, I could hear it and I could feel it. Uh, tried to deal with it by playing around with the mixture and, and the throttle had no effect. Um, I was probably five minutes away from crossing the coast and I didn't fancy flying over the sea like that. So I asked, I made a pan call and asked for a divert into Ostend, which I got. Um, just after I turned on track to Ostend, there's a bang. The oil filler door, which is on the left front side of the, of the cowling, popped open and it became apparent fairly quickly that I didn't have a propeller anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was... <laughs> I was lucky in three ways. One was that I hadn't made it over the sea yet. Um, so I, I was therefore free to glide anywhere that I wanted. Um, secondly, it was a VFR day, so I could see what I was doing. And third, I was high enough. I was at, say, 10,000 feet. So I actually had time. Um, I obviously declared a May Day straight away, uh, told them I was intending to deploy caps. The... Um, <laughs> The air traffic controller asked me if I could land in the sea, which I said no. Um, and I decided that I was, it was clearly going. It was absolutely from the, the instant it happened, it was a caps pull. Um, so what I did was position the aircraft so that I could get it down over over a, a clear open field. Now, on, on the avionics that I have, I get wind speed and direction. And I knew the wind was going to back as I as I descended. 
So basically, I put the aircraft over the edge of a small village and flew away from it in the direction of the wind so that I knew I wouldn't be blown back onto it. Pulled the, pulled the, um, the handle at 3,000 feet. The system operated exactly as advertised, and um, I came down in a field. Made, so, so made the aircraft safe, got out. That was it. Okay, so you're flying along, and all of a sudden the prop departs. Yep. At, at that point, did you know that was a caps pull at that point? Was there, was there any point it, when you went, oh, I wonder what I'm going to do? Or? No, instantly it's a caps pull. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then, then you've got, what, 7,000 feet to, to figure out? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I guess I would, have, I would have, yeah, I'd have flown for seven or eight minutes, I guess, until, until I actually did the deed. Okay, and I mean, when the prop went, did the did the engine overspeed or? Um, I didn't hear it overspeed, and I wasn't. I, I saw that the um, the revs had gone into the red, um, but I was I'd shut the engine down very quickly. Okay, well, I was I was going to say, what did you do? So so the caps pull. I mean, caps has a an, an envelope, a post activation envelope. Um, so presumably, you obviously shut the engine down then. Where, where did you, where did the three thousand feet decision come from? Is that is that something you'd already made or? Uh, yeah, I mean it's a, it's a decision that I'd made uh, before taking off. That if I lost the engine, or if I uh, clearly I, I never visualised losing a propeller because you just don't. Um, but I, I treated that pretty much as I would an engine failure. Um, the decision was made. I will pull caps. I will pull it inside the uh, the envelope. My my my. Um, my preconception was that I'd pull it at 2,000 actually, but in fact I decided to pull it at three just to have that bit of extra padding in there. I knew I, knew I was going to come down somewhere safe. I knew there was nothing I, you know, I was going to hit and therefore just having more time, more time to prepare for the landing just made sense at the time. So presumably you, you, I mean, you probably adopted the best glide speed or something and which, which is within the within the parameter yes. sure yeah uh, best glide in the cirrus is 88 knots so i basically i set it up for 90 um and flew it around at that doing the maneuver i described earlier and then just got to the stage where this is now the right time to pull i will pull and when you reach for the handle i mean was that like a i don't know was it kind of i need to instagram this or uh like, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> no, no. That, that, that was like a slight joke i mean but you know, when you pulled it, is it a, a bigger pull than you thought, or a, a, an no, easier pull? Than... I, no, it was exactly as expected because I'd done it several times in a simulator, so I, I knew exactly what it was. The thing I, I wasn't clear, and I guess you're, you're going to come on and ask me about it, is is what happened after I pulled it, um, yeah. because you can't really simulate that properly. But I, I, I'd done it in a motion simulator, and and the, the the power that you needed to pull it was exactly the same. So come on then, what what happened? You you pull it. <laughs> you pull it. There's a whooshing noise, and then a, a very powerful forward deceleration. It was it was powerful enough to rip my kneeboard off my knee. Um, the aircraft pitches down at about I, I think something like forty five degrees, um, and you're sort of staring at the ground and thinking, I wonder if the line cutters are going to work. And at that point, the the thing I noticed above all was I could smell the cordite from the rocket. Um, after 15 seconds, the line cutters operated as advertised and the aircraft went to the horizontal. Um, and at that point, it, it, it really became very peaceful. You know, it's, it's quiet. It's quieter than flying along with an engine, obviously. And you're just floating. Um, and that would have taken oh, nearly two minutes. I, would think, I think it goes down something like 1,700 feet a minute, um, if I remember the number correctly. So it would have been almost two minutes. And I just remember that being incredibly quiet and peaceful until the last few seconds when you're getting close to the ground and then it really does seem to rush up at you. Um, the aircraft landed horizontally, so, so flat. Um, it's quite a bang. Um, we'll come, come to that picture in a moment. Um, it's, it's quite a bang. I, I would characterize it as being something like being in a, in a 20 mile an hour car crash. Um, but I've obviously got the benefit of being protected by the seats, which have um, a metal honeycomb in them, which is rated to absorb 26 G. So it didn't hurt at all. Um, I was absolutely and completely unhurt. Just was able to make the aircraft safe and get out. 
So, I mean, when 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 the noise stopped and the the violence was over, was there kind of sitting there going, "Am I okay? Is everything?" Yeah. You know, have I done everything? Have I done the checklist? Have I got? Have I actually got the engine off and the electrics off and and so on? And have I assumed the right position, sitting you know, vertically in the seat, holding the straps with my thumbs outside the straps? You know, all the stuff that you're taught at the CPPP is about how you how you should uh, um, operate the system and use it. Have, you know, have I done all that? Yes. Okay. Fine. Well, let's just wait for the bang. Okay. So can can we can we? I think it's the picture of you actually coming down under the chute now. Yeah, go for it. That picture is taken is taken by somebody who's really quite a long way away. As you can see, the aircraft looks tiny. Um, and, and this is an illustration of, of if you when you use the caps, there's a, a, a bloody great bang when the rocket goes off, and people see it, and they have time to get a ca to get a camera or an iPhone out and take a picture of it. I mean, you I mean you can you can judge how far away that is. Um, it's an awful long way, and if somebody's heard it at that distance, um, it, it does make it an event that's fairly obvious. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've got a couple of other pictures here. We've got a portrait picture. That's with the shoot on the. The shoot looks a lot smaller on the ground than I would have thought, to be honest. It's been folded up to stop it blowing away. It, it, okay. It's huge. It's much, it's much, much bigger than that. Basically, that's been rolled up and had a brick stuck on it. Okay, fair enough. And that's a, another picture. Yeah, that's that's how so, it came down. So ignore the prop part of it for now. Clearly, the nose wheels had a bit of a a bit a bit of damage. What the the stuff hanging down behind the trailing edge? Is that just the cap straps? I think so. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I should I should tell you the aircraft has been written off. Okay. Okay. What what year is it? It's to 2005. Okay, cool. And I've got another picture showing the 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 dearly departed yeah. propeller. There was lots of propeller there. Um, has the <laughs> propeller been found? Say again. Has the propeller been found? No, it hasn't. Um, th th I mean, there's a story that I I've been sharing in that context about you know how how hard can it be to find a propeller? Um, one of the things that I did as a, a spin-off from Project Propeller was I flew a veteran to Salzburg a few years ago to commemorate the crew of a Lancaster that was shot down in 1945, bombing the Hitler residence at Ber Berchtesgaden. And their Lancaster was found buried in a field in 2015. And that's a whole Lancaster, not a propeller. Right. So, you know, I, whether it'll ever be found, I, goodness knows. I mean, it, 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 I think it, it came off over open country. And I would imagine it will take... Uh, you know, a tractor, uh, a farmer in his tractor hitting it by accident to find it. So in about 20, 2095, someone's going to plough that up and, and wonder. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to go back and collect it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll come with you. Um, <laughs> I, noticed, I noticed on the ground shot of your aircraft when it was all looking very beautiful that it had a four-bladed prop. Yeah, it's an MT four-bladed prop. It, I mean, that, that's relatively unusual on the Cirrus, isn't it, these days? Uh, yes, it, it, it was replaced about oh, seven years ago. Okay. Yeah. And, and, um, I mean, I'd I mean, I happily tell you the background of it. I was taxiing it on a very dark night at Cambridge um, and I missed my way and uh, the tip of the prop hit a runway light, um, which wrote the prop off. So basically that's, that's why there's an MT on there. Mm. It's been there for seven years, so yeah. And um, and, and I understand there's something slightly strange because you took off from Germany, flew over Holland, and landed, arrived in Belgium. Well, no, I mean this is this is actually quite strange. I didn't fly. I don't think it. Well, I may have flown over a little bit of Holland, but I was talking to Brussels ATC when it happened, um, and everybody assumed that it would be investigated by the Brussels AIB. Um, and they duly turned up and I spent quite a lot of time with their inspector and, 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 and talked a lot to him. And a couple of weeks later, I heard that apparently they'd established from the radar trace that I'd actually been in Dutch airspace when it happened. And now the Dutch have taken the investigation over. <laughs> and I, and, go figure. I don't, I, I don't understand why. And, and 
I'm I'm guessing that no one's expecting anything to happen particularly quickly. Or, is, or is, if, I mean, do you have a do you have a fair idea of why the prop came off at the moment? Or not 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 the slightest. I mean, th there are, there's all manner of speculation. I've talked to um, aircraft engineers who, who know what they're talking about, and everybody's got their theory. I mean, somebody has said that the hubs exploded. Somebody has suggested that the the stop nuts that MT use rather than safety wires that one of them let go. Somebody suggested metal fatigue in one of the bolts. Um, no, pick your theory. Yeah, I mean, it... and and, and well, as we could say, was that I'm not an engineer. So I'm not an engineer, so uh, any uh, opinion that I would have on it is, is is worthless. Well, in the best in the best tradition of of aviation, we can all speculate as much as we like, really. Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. We don't, need to, we don't need to worry about fact or anything. But as 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 uh, has that been changed since you arrived? Is that kind of, or is that just as it was? That's as it landed. The picture was taken probably ten minutes after I, after I got out of the plane. Okay. Hmm. Well, um, I probably be. I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this anyway. There will be in I, over the years. I've learned to learn that there are some people who understand and get Cirruses and get the CAPS system and there are some people who don't get it and there are, of those people who don't get it there are some people who who vehemently don't get it um yeah. as, as far as I'm concerned I mean I, I kind of spent a lot of time talking to a whole bunch of people at Cirrus um Alan, Alan Krapmeyer, Dale Krapmeyer, a whole load of other people and you know if, if effectively it's as far as I understand it it's really all about energy and the formula for energy you know shows that mass and speed increases energy quite a lot really and when you hit the ground you want to dissipate that energy as much as you can um yes and it, land it, it's, under a it, is it's a square it's a square function so it's it's the square of velocity yeah so, and, uh, absolutely so I and mean, I, 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 I i presume john you bought because it sounds like the way you thought about getting into flying you chose this you chose the cirrus and obviously their training and the the option to pull caps specifically for, for the way you were going to fly um, as the Germans say, yein. Um, I, I, I learned to fly with the intention of using it for business and woke up and found that it would be useless for business if I didn't get an instrument rating and if I didn't get a, a quicker aeroplane. Yeah. Um, so I, I started researching it and came down to a choice between a, an SR-22 and a Columbia and then started asking instructors who knew what they were talking about um, and the guy I particularly asked in the UK was John Page, who may be known to you, um, who recommended that I talk to some people in America called the Flight Academy, and I did that, and narrowed it down, and eventually I bought the Cirrus, um, partly for cats, but not as the prince. that wasn't really at the time the principal motivator, and it wasn't really until I got out to America to do the instrument rating and, and, and buy the aircraft, I was sitting for dinner, having having dinner with uh, Luke Lyson and John Fiscus, the two uh, partners who run, own and run the Flight Academy. And I, at the time, I, I was thinking, you know, the CAPS is there for a beginner like me who doesn't know what to do and, and, and pulls it when they get into trouble. And I, I asked these two guys, well, what, how bad would it have to get for you know, sky gods like you to pull it? And the answer was, if I get an engine failure and I'm not over an airport, I'm pulling it. And these are guys who've got you know, ninety three hours of uh, of flying and instructing in services, and and, and I, that w was really telling for me. Um, so I made it my business as part of that training to go to the sim in Las Vegas and do simulator training, and and I, I had the opportunity to try and land a Cirrus with various failures. Um, and one I remember particularly was my instructor failed my horizontal stabilizer, and I tried to fly it, and within about twenty seconds I was over VNE. Um, you know, it's the idea that you, you, you know you're going to try and air, fly an airplane in those circumstances. Um, you know, extreme though the thing I've just described is 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 crazy. So you then get to the the, the, the argument about well, do you pull it if you've got an engine failure? Um, and, and the answer is, if I can get it back on a runway safely, I will. Um, and I've actually done that twice. I've had to. I've had to. Uh, not they've not been full engine failures, but I've had two serious emergencies where I've considered using caps and got the airplane back on the ground safely. But if I, if, if that um, incident that I had um, 
the other day was had been an engine failure that would 90 percent also have been a cap spool because i don't think i was in gliding range of ostend yeah. so yeah i mean it's that, that, that's the philosophy um we are trained it, that those of us who go to the the cirrus pilot proficiency weekends are trained how to use it when to use it what the decision process is what the mindset is and i, I just say this absolutely vehemently and clearly it is not you see a warning light and you pull the handle it's you have a problem you think about it you consider caps you start to manage the the, the emergency as best you can you consider caps you continue to manage the the emergency you consider caps and then if you get to the stage where the airplane is going to go out of its um uh, envelope of safe operation or if you're if you haven't made it into uh, in, into glide range of a usable runway, you pull. And, and that's the philosophy. That's the way that it's trained. That's the way that I learned and that's the way that I used it. Uh, so a, a couple of questions from people here. Um, uh, this one won't surprise you. It's from uh, Jonathan Holland. What would you have done if you didn't have caps? I mean, tough tough question because you did have caps, but you wouldn't have had a huge amount of choice anyway. Would you? No, absolutely. And I would have done what anybody else would have had to have done, find the best looking field I could find and do a false landing. Um, I, I might have tried to stretch the glide to Ostend, but don't think I'd have made it. Somebody in one of the forums said that there was another airport somewhere near me. Perhaps I would have looked for that and, and, and tried to put it down there. Um, but I would have been committed to a forced landing. And if you if you go back to that photograph of my aircraft, a long shot of my aircraft on the ground, you can see what kind of a field that was. Um, you know, half of it is full of two foot high potato plants and the other half looks like that's the one. The, 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 the green on the right is the, is, the, um, is the potato field. Those are two foot high plants. And the mud on the left is, is really sticky glutinous stuff. It's sort of World War I stuff. Um, I do not believe that landing a tricycle gear aircraft at, at 60 knots, um, I don't think it would have ended well. And I, there's, no, I no, and there's, there's often the thing that I think people sometimes forget is you go, you do aim to have a successful force landing sometimes if you're put in that situation, but it's a high pressure situation and things often go wrong. And I think if you've got an option to pull a chute at the time, I think it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because you go, that is in control now of making, of getting you down safely. And there's, there's going to be no last minute thing mm. that potentially hurts you yeah. or hurts someone on the ground. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You, that, that you can't go around with a forced landing. No. You just, you know, mm. you are committed, you are going to land it and you're going to do the best that you can. And, and going back to the point about kinetic energy a while ago, you are going to have to dissipate 10 times the energy that you do coming up, down under caps. And you're going to do it in a horizontal direction rather than just mm. landing flat. But, I, mean, it's, I don't know about anybody else that scares me. Um, you know, again, some of the people who, who have criticised caps clearly are people who do a lot of flying where they land tail draggers in fields. And those aircraft are designed for that and good for them. Um, no I have no problem with, with, with that at all. But they're a very different proposition from landing something with a tricycle landing gear um, with a stall speed of 60 knots or 59 knots. Mm -hmm. no, you know, so, so, somebody once, once um, described it to me as, imagine you're trying to drive a Reliant Robin across a cloud field at 60 miles an hour. Yeah. Anybody <laughs> fancy that? I don't <laughs> No, I'm not yeah. sure if are going to use that in their marketing, though. Um, <laughs> I don't think they need well, my help. I think uh, if you want a new one, I think you've got to wait till about 2025. Mm. Well, so, which brings us on to another question that somebody asked a little bit further up in the questions. Which, uh, what, what are you going to do about an aeroplane now? I'm negotiating right as we speak. And the answer Excellent. to the question that's just come up is another SR-22. Excellent. Excellent. Totally good. Totally good. Um, any any of you guys got any other questions? I'm kind of there are some questions in there. There's some there's some people going, well, you know, you need to go be and I, I don't think frankly, I don't think it's this is the time or place to have that discussion about what you should or shouldn't do. I mean, clearly it's in the POH. There's an awful lot of massively experienced pilots who've already been through that, decided, know what they're gonna do. The the safety record is proven. Um, well, my, 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 new, my new lucky number, Ian, is 119. 
because I was the 119th Caps pull, oh. and deployed within parameters. Nobody's ever been killed in the airport, in the aircraft, or on the ground. Or on the ground, no. Yeah. That's good. Oh, Sorry, Sarah. Uh, I have a question for you, John. Um, have you contacted Cirrus or have Cirrus contacted you at all? Sometimes they do um, stories on their website about you know real caps calls. Uh, nothing from Cirrus. Um, I've obviously been speaking to the guys at Copa, and um, I, I've, I'm actually I was already supposed to be appearing in the Copa magazine as a profile piece in, in December. Um, which, as you can imagine, has had a bit of a rewrite. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let me just have a quick... There's a comment from Katkin. She said, when I was flying over Minnesota near the Duluth factory and had an issue with a chipmunk, I looked around for somewhere to land. There was only trees or swamp. At that point, I really started to appreciate the existence of cats. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And out of 7,000 aeroplanes, 190 caps pulls isn't many. So it's, it's, no. not, it's not 190, it's 100. It's actually now 120. I was 119. Okay. And cool. I, I think and, the, other, the other thing, sorry, Ed, carry on. No, no, I, I, and I presume that that's all those pulls have resulted in people who are here today. Uh, almost all of them. There have been, there have been a, a small number of anomalies where the where the guys pulled at uh, two or three hundred feet yeah. and people people have died. The 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 spec is that the the, the floor thaw is supposed to be two uh, two thousand feet, but people have pulled as low as um, as low as four hundred and fifty and survived. Um, there's I think been one fatality where the guy pulled at five hundred and twenty eight feet, where the pilot died and three passengers lived. Yeah. But other than yeah. that, other than that, anything over five hundred feet. Um, everybody survived and there's never been a casualty on the ground yeah as i think there's a there's a good comment that sums it up here tom watson says pull the handle and deal with the internet haters later because i i'm sure a lot of them placed with the situation would you like to live or die but I, I well i yes i mean i i don't really see it as haters i see uh, see it but some of them disagree with me and they disagree for for quite reasonable reasons in their eyes um, I try to persuade them. I know I'm not going to persuade those individuals. What I'm, what the people I'm trying to persuade is the guy who was me in 2007, who's just, you know, buying himself and his his first aircraft and starting really to learn properly how to fly it, having a problem and thinking, well, Christ, if I pull the handle now, I'm going to get roasted on the internet, so I won't pull it. Um, and, uh, you can laugh at it, but actually, yeah. silly things yeah. like that do influence people. Really. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. that, that's why I have the arguments. Otherwise, I mean, yeah. if, if there wasn't that aim in there, I wouldn't bother. I'd just walk away from it and say, well, you, know, you want to hate me, hate me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's... I think that's very, very true. It's, it's the, the whole internet world is interesting because you often have a conversation between one to one, but there is an audience of many thousands who are watching yes. that. They're the people who don't yeah. engage, and they're the people who the, the audience is really playing out for. Um, so quick, quick post here from Cat, Cat Burton. Interesting, but basically ends up the latter to safe landing assured. Caps is assured. So absolutely straight on there. Good. Um, John, thank you very, very much for joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion. We could continue to talk. And maybe when, when the accident report's out and we can all learn a little bit more about, you know, at least satisfy our curiosity, if nothing else, perhaps you come back and, and talk us through it and uh, maybe tell us how you're getting on with your new series by then, hopefully. With great pleasure, and thank you very much for having me on. It's been fun. We're glad to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely right. Now, if I can get this bit right, I can play a little stinger and rearrange it, and we can get on to the next bit. Thank you very much, John, and hope to see you at an airfield soon. Yeah, Merry Good Christmas, John. And thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Merry Imagine. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hello. Move you up here. Oh, what's happened there? I don't know. What oh, were you expecting? I've lost all my <laughs> controls. Oh, no. Okay. Good. Well, I tell you what, while you're finding your controls, it must be time. Oh, back. 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 Go for it. It must. Well, I need to find it now. There we go. There you go. Yeah, Clive Sutton says, great interview. Thanks for sharing your experience, John. Yeah. So.
Yeah, absolutely. Well done. Thank you. Yes. Fancy so, hanging. Um, well, actually, is this a good time to um, to play the video? It is. Oh. It is. You should probably explain it first. Yes. Um, so, obviously, a while ago in um, Live Stream Extra, uh, we were talking about the news that Airfix was bringing out a new big Spitfire kit. And um, then later on, we were talking about the fact that, you know, we probably it might be fun to, um, to for the presenters to get a bunch of kits and build them in a Bake Off style. And uh, luckily, Airfix was listening and sent us the kits and said, make that video. Um, so we did yesterday, and um, here's a little teaser to, um, to whet your appetite. Now, the good, good news is you can watch that because we're taking a week off next week. You can watch that on December the 29th. Uh, so that will be watching the watching paint dry, which is the uh, the Flyer live stream team kit off. And spoiler alert, there is no kit off, luckily. <laughs> yeah. Um, and ju just a heads up on the on next week's, next week's live stream, which is not actually a live stream. It's a non-live live stream. Um, so we will have Sky Demon tip for you. We will have Simon's weather for you. And we will have the world premiere of watching paint dry which yes. will hopefully be it took us over an hour to build it but it won't be a video of over an hour don't worry uh, no and it will require you will that we'll we're placing the decision of who wins the um, the flyer kit off with you the viewers so um you will um you will get the the chance to proclaim the winner who will will, will announce in the following week's live stream as colin wilkinson says there good hammer action which <laughs> <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't spotted the bit about Johnny cutting up one of the mince pies with a knife. It's not like there's a shortage. Yeah, pies. and we can tell you that Johnny did successfully birth a Spitfire, not a, yeah. not a mince pie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. Time so, for some... um, so, yeah, so inspired by that, we thought, hey, let's pick um, some models that we would build for our fancy hangers. Um, so who's first? Sarah's actually first. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Ah, that's interesting. I Carry on, Sarah. So I've gone for the North American P51 Mustang. Um, although, as soon as I picked it, it said skill level expert. <laughs> and considering <laughs> I've not bought any of them before, I think it was a bit <laughs> ambitious of me. But um, I've, yeah, I went to Eastbourne Airborne um, show, air show this year, and I saw the um, P51 Mustang do a um, display. And that's probably the first time I've seen a display of it. And it was just absolutely incredible, the noise of it, and, and what it could do was amazing. So I have an appreciation for aircraft. So that would be mine. Excellent choice. Okay, like that. Great, really good. Ed, I see you, you mocked around with yours a bit, so I'm going to make you go next. You can make me go next, because I, I, I've actually... I've, you can throw in the... Um, you can throw in number two uh, once I've done number one. Because, uh, actually, I picked this, which is the, um, the GB Model Z, uh, which is built from a 132nd kit um, from an American kit maker called the Williams Brothers. Um, so the GB was a racing aeroplane in the 30s, um, uh, and it was it, they put it together in something like five weeks, um, and it went on, won a bunch of races uh, before they tried to set a speed record with it, where it came apart and um, sadly killed the pilot. But I've always loved this aeroplane, and... Um, and it's it appears it makes a starring appearance in the disney film the rocketeer and um that's just always been a favorite for me and when i found out there was a fantastic little kit you could build of it i thought oh, i definitely want one of those um but what i did find while i was looking around at kit airplanes is i found this which was a brilliant model of the airplane i've just bought <laughs> <laughs> yes but um i think i'd still go for the gb <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, go yeah, for the GB, which I'm going to, now brings us down to Dave. Well, what do you expect I'm going to choose? It has to be a Luscombe 8 Silver, of course, and luckily Keelcraft uh, makes, uh, makes two models, actually. They make two versions. This is the 21-inch version, 21-inch uh, wingspan version, but apparently there's also a 40-inch 
but we couldn't find a photo of that. But uh, so this is what I have a choice. It's um, one to tw one to twenty one scale um, model. Um, yeah, that's what that I is. Choose. That is beautiful. That, mm. and that, that's what that is you beautiful. Fly rather than our plastic kits. Mm. Yeah. yeah. However, <laughs> tempering Dave's choice of a beautiful kit was Dave's initial choice of a not so beautiful kit. Oh, my <laughs> eyes. My eyes. I know. What it's, the... like, it's, it's like a Luscom, but if, if the world only existed in like 300 pixels by 10 pixels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, that, that is definitely grim. Grim, grim, grim. But anyway, we'll forgive you that as soon as and we, we found another we one. We found in the right Luscom. We found in the right way. Otherwise, we'd have had to fire him. Katkin says, "Is that legal?" No, Katkin, it's not. No, it's clearly. <laughs> Johnny. Yep. So I've gone for a Lancaster because they're great. Um, but I found an absolute monster of a Lancaster. So this is it. The kit. It, it's a plastic kit. Um, it's three hundred and fifty quid for the kit. That must what? be quite big, Johnny. Sorry. That must be quite big. Yeah, this is... Ooh, that's enormous. We both clicked it. This is it. Absolute huge behemoth. It's just under a metre from wingtip to wingtip. Um, and I've just found the instruction manual on the... It's built by a company called HK, not Hector and Cock. Firearm Hong Kong. But <laughs> an HK in, in China. The... the PDF document is a hundred megabytes. <laughs> wow. Okay. You, uh, that's 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 the kind of model that actually needs nearly needs a full size hanger of its own. Mm. I mean, I don't think it would fit on your shelf. My my wife does like aviation and flying, but if I built one of those, which is which is extremely unlikely, but if I did build one of those, she'd let said, you put right, on the team, wouldn't she? <laughs> I've I've spent a year building this, and it looks lovely. Can we put it? I, I suspect it would end up in my office. <laughs> my tiny, tiny, tiny office. Right. Okay. So uh, my, my, I'm, I'm up next. I think so. I was kind of, I was actually looking around for a really nice Harrier kit because I thought Harrier would be quite good for fun, wouldn't it? And I, I do remember actually building one of those a long, long time ago. Um, um, but I found a really, I, I found a, an 18, 18 scale one uh, from a company called Hobby Boss. Um, and here are some. Oh, I think, and it's got a huge amount of detail and a huge amount of stuff. Whoops, no, no, it's definitely not that one. It's that one there. So I thought, I mean, I'm not entirely convinced about the paint job on this one, to be perfectly honest. I think it's been it, sort of over-weathered. It's quite um, over-weathered, isn't it? Yeah. It is over-weathered, that, yeah. that is a big area. One uh, eighteenth. Did you say it's one eighteenth scale? One eighteenth. One eighteenth scale. There is a, a video of, of the guy who's got it on a sort of big, lazy Susan, sort of showing people going, in an American accent, this is the awesome yeah. airplane I built. I weathered it, but uh, yeah. So I think I think I would go for that. And I think having a real Harrier in the fancy Harrier, I wouldn't fly it, obviously, because it'd kill me. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that would be good. So right there, you go. What have we got in terms of feedback from the old? Uh, well, Whiskey Alpha Pilot suggested that he'd like an SR seventy one. Um, Katkin is wearing her, her Mustang aficionado. I'm not sure if uh, I'm not sure if Sarah said it was a P51D. She may have just said it was a P51, um, uh, but obviously Katkin spotted it was a B model, not a D model. Um, Dave White notes that the colours of the GB are familiar. Yes, no, I do like yellow and black on certain aeroplanes. Ed's strong already. It's Ed to beat. Um, I'm su surprised that Dave picked the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus Clark, my wife says Dave wins. Marcus, is your wife? Is, does she need to go to Specsavers? <laughs> um, what else have we got? Uh, Johnny wins. I know Dave White does like a big Lancaster. Um, Whiskey Alpha Pilot, my be best comment from the night. Ooh, it had bombs. <laughs> <laughs> it was close yeah. until Johnny went to Lancaster. Wow, that's a monster. Um, Johnny is in the lead. Johnny wins. Johnny wins. Um, Melanie Moxon once built a 140th scale of a C C130. That must have been quite big. Anything with bombs is uh, w with that number of bombs will win. Johnny has a strong entry. I think Johnny uh, Ian will have to have something special. Steampunk Harrier 
Johnny wins by a mile. Ian wins. Lancaster just pips it. Sarah wins. Um, despite oh. the fact that it's the US Air Force version, I think Ian wins. Johnny wins. Johnny wins. Johnny wins. It's Lancaster. It could be a Johnny, um, a Johnny tidal wave. Uh, Andrew Calcott would have gone for a mosquito. FX make a nice big one of those. Ed wins because I'd like to fly a real one. There is one you can, well, there's one that does fly in Florida that hasn't flown in a while. So Johnny yeah. wins. I'd go for a Corsair. Dave wins the worst choice. <laughs> I'd like <a> cheeky. <laughs> okay, in, in true YouTube. <laughs> can, can I just ask people, if you're not watching this live and you're watching this on catch up, then let us know. Uh, which air which which kit you'd have built, which kit you'd have chosen, which kit you, or which kit you built last, in fact. Mm. Um, so yeah, let us know in there. What else have we got? Oh, I've lost my little running sheet there. Dave, you must be on. Must be time for some events. Yes, just there's not very much on at the moment. So uh, there's a New Year's Day flying at Bodmin. We there's normally there's new, normally more than one flying on New Year's Day, but this is the only one we could find. So if you if you know of any others, let us know. Um, just a reminder that the tickets are now available for Aero Friedrichshafen. Yes. Uh, that's the 19th to the 22nd of April. They're now available online at the website. And Oshkosh, the tickets are now available for that as well. Uh, that's on the 24th to the 30th of July. That's it. Very good. I have to, have to say, I am very much looking forward to both Aero and Oshkosh this year. Or next Two year, best shows say. in the world. Yeah. I know. I, I mean, no, I am I am very, very much looking forward to those. I think we've come to the end, and we're only six minutes over, which is pretty good. So thank you very much for watching tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. As I said, uh, next week's live stream will be kicking off at half past seven, and it will have, hopefully, the premiere of watching paint dry, which will be slightly more interesting than watching paint dry, but there's no guarantees on that, to be honest. Um, we'll just hope so. And we'll be back on the 5th. So if you're flying over Christmas and New Year, have a safe one. Enjoy it. Have fun. If we bump into you at an airfield, not literally, obviously, just metaphorically, Come and say hello. Um, and oh, there you go. Uh, I could have done that, couldn't I? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, team. It's been a great year. Another another <laughs> cracking year of live streams and Oshkosh videos and Aero videos and all sorts. And hopefully next year there'll be even more. Um, yeah. Little last minute from last minute message. Have you joined yet? If you're not a member, come on, join. Yeah. Um, please. Um, so, yeah, that's that. I think is it for... It for 2022. So, so see us in 2023 when we'll have a new challenge for you to follow Fly 2022, which we'll be rounding up and announcing the winners of as well. Yeah, absolutely. Head set up for grabs there, plus um, a, a day's flying in Cirrus or not a day's a, a 20, uh, anyway, a Cirrus experience, let's yes. call it. That's um, cool. Hopefully, with the prop at both ends of the flight. Um, <laughs> But yeah, thanks, thanks to Jono. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, have a great Christmas and have a great New Year. Have safe flying in between. We'll see you in 2023. Yeah, take care, everyone. See have you. a Christmas. Bye. Bye. Bye.